Góðan daginn allsömur, velkomin í Þjóðminjasafni og velkomin á fyrirlestur í hátegis fyrirlestraröð safnsins. Ég heiti Þorvaldur Óttar Guðlaugsson og ég er vaktstjóri hérna í Þjóðminjasafninu. Ég ætla nú aðeins að kynna fyrirlestara dagsins. Það er sem sagt Joe Walser og hann er mannabeinafræðingur og sérfræðingur hjá Þjóðminjasafni Íslands. Og ég vil ekki að aðdiklikar á því að fyrirlesturinn fer fram á ensku og ef það er nú einhverjur ensku maldi hérna þá er það svona Our lecturer today is Joe Walser, he is an osteologist and a specialist at the National Museum of Iceland and the lecture will be in English. Hello, I'm just going to get right to it. Uh, so during this talk, the aim is to discuss the history and social and medical implications of various rare and ancient diseases that have been identified in archaeological skeletal remains from Iceland. Uh, using results from various scientific analyses, the study seeks to consider how researching rare or ancient conditions can impart meaningful knowledge about disease or pathological conditions in the past, how they have changed over time and what that means for us today. Understanding the choices people make and their motivations in providing care requires us to consider emotional experiences as they are central to the human condition and give meaning and force to social context. So, using case studies, this research also seeks to examine care and collective social emotion in past populations. Uh, human origins are relevant to past health because they also provide a sense of where some diseases might come from geographically and how others may develop within a genetic population and the environments people reside in. So to provide some context, isotope studies have demonstrated that most of the skeletal remains analyzed from Icelandic archaeological sites represent individuals born and raised in Iceland. As can be seen on image A, the majority of the identified migrants came to Iceland during the settlement era, marked pagan here, as indicated by the black bars exceeding the red line. Though fewer in number, other immigrants, marked Christian here, came to Iceland at later. The results of a recent isotope study on image B shows that all of the analyzed individuals from Skriðiklæstur were born in Iceland and grew up locally. While those plotted in yellow, such as LKS1, also known as Blaukleidekonen, uh, represent individuals that were born abroad. This is important to understanding the international nature of Iceland in the past, which was clearly never, never isolated from the world. It appears rather that ideas, skills, technology, and diseases all reached Iceland contemporaneously with developments in mainland Europe. For example, as can be seen from Skri the Cloistered, venereal syphilis spread to Iceland at the same time it reached epidemic levels in Europe, following the voyage of Columbus in 1493, but more on that later. This raises other questions that are difficult to answer. For example, how was this new and devastating disease understood, and how was an individual with syphilis perceived by society? Did they experience social marginalization in Icelandic society as they did so commonly in the British Isles? In collaboration with DECODE, ancient DNA analyses conducted on skeletons from our collection have demonstrated that the Icelandic population arose predominantly from Norse and Celtic or Gaelic ancestry, with some individuals actually being Norse scales, meaning individuals of mixed ancestry were also a part of the original settlement population. As can be seen on image A on the slide, modern Icelanders appear significantly different than the ancient Icelanders, partly due to genetic drift over time, further demonstrated by the 13th and 17th century individuals plotting somewhere in between. On image B, you can see where the ancient Icelanders plotted amongst the, Nor the ancient Norse, Gaels, and other past populations of the British and Irish Isles in comparison with modern Icelanders. These findings are essentially in line with the archaeological heritage of Iceland, which boasts artifacts indicative of traditions based in these re regions of the North Atlantic. During this presentation, the antiquity of several rare diseases, variations, and conditions in Iceland will be discussed through examples of cleft palate, syphilis, 
Paget's disease of bone, Kleinfelter syndrome, and neoplastic disease uh, from the skeletal pres uh, assemblages preserved at the National Museum of Iceland. Oral facial clefts, like cleft palates, are some of the most common types of birth defects, with up to 1% of babies affected, though its prevalence does vary by country, sex, and ethnicity, and has strong genetic and environmental associations. Oral facial clefts can increase risk of infection and decrease the ability to obtain substantial nutrition, thereby causing serious health implication in cases that are not corrected with surgery. In the past, infants with cleft palate had to be hand-fed, meaning that significant social care was required, especially for the first year of life, for there to be any chance of the child's survival. In the past, it is often believed that successful surgical interventions for cleft palate were exceedingly rare if ever performed, although an isolated cleft lip, also known as hair lip, could be repaired through suturing. Non-surgical treatment with herbs, earth elements, or metals, and other substances were also provided, and these may have provided some aid in reducing the risk of infection. The Icelandic sagas describe one individual called Thorgil Skardi that sought surgical intervention for congenital cleft lip in Norway in 1242. The results are only vaguely described, but it appears to have gone well. In the sagas, he was described as a handsome man in appearance that was strong, hardy, and vigorous in whatever he entered upon. The way he was described and the lack of em emphasis on the impairment or potentially disabling condition he experienced may indicate that such conditions were not necessarily met with aversion and social marginalization. Until the middle of the 20th century, most Icelandic children with cleft palate or lip did not receive treatment. Some of them could be treated by general surgeons and just a few of them were sent abroad. Today, most children born with oral facial clefts undergo corrective surgery, and according to surveys, Icelanders that undergo surgeries for these conditions do not perceive that their birth condition influenced their overall life to a great extent, and are generally satisfied with the treatment they receive. There is just one clear case of congenital cleft palate with the cleft lip in the skeletal assemblages preserved at the museum. However, one other individual with two large irregular palatal perforations were also noted. Both individuals were excavated from the cemetery at Skridekleister. The second individual also shows evidence of syphilis, which causes severe bone destruction in late-stage infections, such as cranial and palatal perforations. The individual with congenital cleft palate was a teenager identified at SKR 22 who consumed a different diet to others residing at the monastery. Their diet was essentially void of marine protein such as fish which was essential to the diet there likely due to religious fasting. As can be seen on the plot this individual is well placed within the samples measured from the comparative site Skeljastavir where the protein part of the diet was predominantly terrestrial or derived from livestock meat. In fact, this person's isotope profile is the same as those determined in modern-day Danish vegans. Additionally, possibly because of dietary limitations, 50% of their teeth exhibited linear enamel hypoplasia, which is an enamel defect uh, that indicates stress, sickness, or poor nutrition during childhood. This stark difference in diet is likely related to the unilateral cleft lip and cleft palate, the expression most commonly seen in modern-day Icelandic males. Due to the young age at death, however, a sex estimation cannot be provided without future ADNA analysis. A high degree of care dedicated to this individual may also be indicated by their death and burial at Skridekleister. People in need of medical treatment traveled to the monastery, but for many, this journey involved traveling a significant distance, potentially during dark, cold, or harsh winters. Considering the individual's age, it is also likely that they required significant assistance from their family or society to make such a journey possible. 
On image A, the congenital case, you can see the smooth, almost symmetrical appearance, which contrasts with the rough, irregular shapes and edges seen in the infectious case on image B. These changes likely occurred in adulthood as a result of late-stage syphilis. Unlike the individual with congenital cleft palate, this person had a saltwater fish-heavy diet similar to the other inhabitants at the monastery. Individuals with cleft palate tend to have dental problems like cavities, difficulties with speech, and increased risk of ear infection due to the fluid buildup in the middle ear. Without surgical implants designed to, dra to drain fluid from the ears, hearing loss can occur. Though difficult to assess from skeletal remains, could this person have experienced a speech impediment or a sensory impairment like hearing loss? How might those impairments affect communication, so social integration, or occupational roles? If we consider the modern implications of life, with, of life with cleft palate and cleft lip in our case study from medieval Iceland, we may glean some insight into possible versions of the lived experiences of individuals surviving with these conditions in the past. That this person survived until late in their teen years demonstrates that they were provided with special care or assistance, particularly in infancy and early childhood. Next, we move on to the discussion of syphilis. Uh, the origin and spread of syphilis remains a topic of ongoing debate, but many scholars favor the opinion that it appeared in Europe in the late 15th century, post-contact with the New World. It has even been suggested that Vikings may have played a role in the spread of syphilis following the establishment of their settlements in the New World, but the literary and skeletal records really don't attest to this. Determining the, the origin of syphilis in the Old World is also complicated by difficulties in assigning definitive diagnosis from skeletal remains and the lack of reliable dating. Syphilis was primarily treated with mercury, which was administered by topical, topically applying salves and inhaling a vaporized form. Patients normally received treatments lasting months or even years, giving rise to the saying, one night with Venus, a lifetime with mercury. Uh, Dr. Jón Hjaltelin, a 19th century inspecting medical officer of Iceland, believed mercury to be quite effective for the treatment of both syphilis and Hadada disease, or Suttler. Though its toxicity has been known since ancient times, it remained to be the most common treatment for syphilis until penicillin was introduced in 1940. Interestingly, mercury is still used today for spiritual, ritualistic, and medicinal purposes in some countries, with the belief that it could ward off evil, incite love, luck, or wealth, purify the home, or even increase, increase muscle mass, I guess when weightlifting and protein shakes just aren't cutting it anymore. <laughs> Today, mercury toxicity is high among populations residing in the Faroe Islands and Greenland due to the consumption of sea mammals contaminated with biologically cycled mercury, also known as methylmercury, within the ocean. Mercury toxicity has been correlated with an increased risk or severity of autism, neurological disorders, and other conditions in these countries. While syphilis was not actually a rare disease, it, it even reached epidemic levels in Europe. It is, however, relatively rare in the skeletal record, despite it being one of the few diseases that cause distinctive bone changes that often enable osteologists to make confident diagnoses. This is due to a number of reasons, including that pathological bone is more fragile than healthy bone, and therefore it may not survive as well in the burial environment. Additionally, diagnostic skeletal changes indicative of syphilis result from a long-term chronic infection, meaning that someone must first survive with the condition for years or even decades for the bone changes to appear. If you take note of the severe changes to the forehead of this 19th century individual, you'll see a similar pattern on the dry skull on the next slide. Several individuals from Skrydekloster show strong evidence of long-standing bone changes indicative of venereal syphilis, which demonstrates, as I said earlier, that the disease reached Iceland at the same time the major outbreak outbreaks occurred in mainland Europe. 
Additionally, elevated mercury levels among syphilis patients from the monastery indicates that mercury was used medicinally, which means that mercury and the skills for treating people likely came to Iceland around the same time. Today, Iceland has the proportionally highest rate of new syphilis diagnoses in Europe. The frequency of chlamydia, also known as the Reykjavik handshake, is likewise believed to be the highest in Iceland out of all of Europe. Some conditions like gonorrhea and chlamydia have seen striking rises in antibiotic resistance due to repeated infection and treatment to the point where some strains have actually become almost completely immune to most available antibiotics. There are numerous reasons as to why syphilis appears to be so prevalent here, ranging from failure in sex education and lack of regular STI testing to statistics based on a small sample size. I mean that comparisons between a nation of 350,000 to a nation with 67 million, like the UK, may cause the results to appear a bit skewed. In collaboration with DECODE, we intend to attempt to use ancient DNA analyses to further examine archaeological cases of syphilis from our collection and address such questions. Recent technological advances have only just made this possible. Investigations on syphilis in the past could possibly contribute to understanding the disease, antibiotic resistance in the present, as well as enable us to trace the history and development of the pathogens. So, on to Paget's disease of bone, a condition which appears to be caused by environmental factors acting upon a genetically susceptible individual. It is significantly more frequent in males than in females, uh, predominantly affects the skeletal system, and is characterized by the irregular and excessive growth and remodeling of bone. The skull is usually involved causing a cotton wool appearance and the expansion of the cranial vault. The condition is very rare, though, though it is likely underrepresented in the skeletal record because not all bones of the body are always affected, meaning diagnoses of new cases are often limited by the preservation and completeness of excavated skeletal remains. As can be seen in the illustrations, the cranium is altered in the duchess, whereas in the bottom figure, the spine and limbs are noticeably altered despite the lack of cranial change. Essentially, the condition can cause dramatic and disfiguring skeletal changes, particularly in the past before the development of modern medicines that are used to limit the uncontrolled growth and expansion of bone were created. In a clinical survey, it was found that approximately half of the 2,000 individuals interviewed reported poor overall health and feelings of depression, much of which was due to emotional and social factors. One older male individual excavated from Skridekleister shows skeletal changes consistent with Paget's disease, including a regular cranial and postcranial bone expansion, deposition, and remodeling on several bones, while other bones remained unaffected. According to isotope analyses, he appears to not, have, not only have lived further inland prior to migration to the monastery, but also to have consumed the childhood diet derived more heavily from livestock rather than from seafood, like most people of the area. This individual likely experienced notable mobility impairment and yet still traveled from an inland area to the monastery to seek treatment or hospice there. Could this person have faced emotional and social conditions similar to those experienced by people with Paget's disease today? Perhaps he was motivated to seek treatment by a community support network. In a worldwide literature review of archaeological cases of Paget's disease of bone, it was found that 94% of cases came from the United Kingdom, with no cases coming from beyond Western Europe. This strong geographic distribution of Paget's disease of bone indicates that it originated in Western Europe, if not even in the UK. The archaeological case and origins of the disease are interesting because the condition persists in Iceland today, the genetic heritage of the Icelandic settlement population composed predominantly of the Norse and populations residing in the British, British Isles, as previously discussed, could therefore indicate the origin of Paget's disease in Iceland and possibly demonstrates the genetic continuity of the condition across time. 
here you can see a clean version of the radiograph without the arrows. Kleinfelter syndrome, or XXY, results in an intersex expression that normally occurs randomly due to atyp atypical sex chromosome variation. While modern society has begun to make steps towards understanding that gender is socially constructed, is not binary, and can change during an individual's life, it is still generally be believed that physical bodies fit within the typical binary of male or female. In fact, noticeably, Atypical or non-binary genitalia are noted in almost 2% of the human population, which is about the same proportion of people born with red hair. But the number of intersex individuals is actually much higher than that, because subtle forms of anatomical variation may not be apparent until later in life. So we already know that biological sex is not a definitive measure of gender identity, but we should also consider in the future whether sex chromosomes and bodily ana anatomy are also a truly definitive measure of biological sex. When one archaeological individual pictured here was found in a pagan grave in the Snyfelsnes region, they were initially identified as male due to the presence of grave goods, which have often been associated with male gender or sex estimations, including a spear, shield, knife, and the sword shown on the slide. Upon skeletal analysis, sex and age estimation was complicated. The individual displays a mix of male and female skeletal traits, as well as delayed skeletal development, which indicates a younger age than the, de the dental development and dental wear does. The most likely osteological diagnosis of this individual is hypogonadism, as caused by Kleinfelter syndrome or castration at a young age, as Hildur Gestalt did reported in a 1998 publication. However, recent ancient DNA analysis has shown that this individual did not have Kleinfelter syndrome and presented with typical XY sex chromosomes. Traumatic injury or cultural body modification like castration are still convincing differential diagnoses for the observed atypical development in this person. Regardless, this does not mean that this person was or was not an intersex individual, as there are numerous other conditions or biological variations beyond Kleinfelter's that may present without sex chromosome anomalies. Coincidentally, another individual was actually identified with XXY chromosomes, providing the first ever ancient DNA diagnosis of Kleinfelter syndrome in an archaeological individual. However, due to the incompleteness of the skeleton, skeletal anomalies associated with the condition cannot be observed. These conditions or variations are not new or unusual. And though they appear to be rare, perhaps because of cultural marginalization and silencing of those with these differences, they are actually relatively common. This creates another layer to our understanding of demographics reconstructed with archaeological remains and our methods of categorizing people by sex based upon skeletal features or ancient DNA analysis. Sometimes things are exactly as they seem, and other times they are anything but. Object identification has often imparted assumptions about sex identification, and inversely, sex identification has also engendered our interpretations of grave goods or other archaeological objects and social roles. That this individual was buried with typically male gendered grave goods might provide indications about their gender identity, though they might not as well. For example, if we consider the discovery of women buried with male gendered grave goods like swords, we can remind ourselves that grave goods sometimes represent the society rather than individuals, and other times they represent an individual identity <coughs> that does not always fit within our modern interpretation of past social structures. And finally, we come to neoplastic disease or cancer in the past. Both benign and malignant forms of cancer are also found in archaeological skeletal remains from Iceland and throughout the world. While these conditions are very rare, it is not necessarily correct for us to assume that cancer cases have dramatically increased in the present. However, there are two main reasons that cancers may appear to be more common in the present. The first is that cancer risk increases with age, and modern people are generally believed to have longer lifespans, not because the actual human lifespan has increased, 
but because of modern medicine, contraception, improved maternity care, and contagion ma management. So for example, if a young adult passed away from a previously untreatable disease like tuberculosis, they would not have had the time to develop cancers, particularly considering that 85% of all new cancer, cancer cases occur over the age of 50. The second reason is that certain populations of people in the past lived in more pristine or unpolluted environments with less exposure to cancer-causing agents. While, these may be more, while there may be more potential sources of cancer-causing uh, pollution and materials today, many were nonetheless present in the past. An additional consideration is that bone cancers only make up 1% of all cancers, and we normally only have skeletal remains to work with. For example, as early as the first century AD, the Romans began extensively utilizing cancer-causing elements through the mining of cinnabar for mercury and the use of lead for the construction of pipes, infrastructure, household objects, and even for food dishes. In fact, the majority of the world's mercury pollution actually began and occurred prior to and during the medieval period. Similarly, occupational exposure to cancer-causing substances has decreased in the recent past as the use of safety measures and availability of medical interventions have increased significantly. From the Icelandic skeletal record, there are several examples of individuals with benign cancerous tumors on the cranium and osteochondromas, benign cartilage cap tumors, often found around growth plates. Of special note is one individual recovered by Hildur Gestatir at Hofstadir and another by Gwilni Zoega at Keldudalir, each with skeletal evidence suggestive of a malignant cancer called myeloma, which is a rare condition today, particularly in people under the age of 65. It has demonstrated some heritability, but environmental and other factors such as sex and race appear to increase risk. Archaeologically, less than 30 verifiable examples have been discovered worldwide, indicating the rarity of the condition as well as the importance of noting that two such cases come from early medieval Iceland. A recent study demonstrated that malignant tumors were pre prevalent at least 4,500 years or more ago, provided essentially that individuals reach a sufficient age for tumor-promoting defects to manifest clinically. That recent study, conducted on over 900 individuals from ancient Egypt, demonstrated similar prevalence rates to a control group of individuals analyzed from 20th century England. The rate of new cancer cases did not increase over time. In fact, some types of cancers, such as nasopharyngeal carcinoma, occurred at higher rates in the past than those seen in modern populations. This is not a, to dismiss the severity of modern populations pollution or occupational, dietary, and behavioral exposure to carcinogens, but rather to note that carcinogen exposure has simply changed over time and has differed across culture, occupation, genetics, and geography, but has affected populations throughout human history. By considering evolutionary medicine and biology in conjunction with population health today, it is clear that there are mismatches to modern life that lead to disease. Essentially, our biology cannot keep up with the rate of our cultural change. For example, the Industrial Revolution in the UK saw a significant rise in the rate of rickets or osteomalacia cases, conditions caused by vitamin D deficiency. This was likely due to poor nutrition and occupational factors, such as indoor factory work beginning in childhood, as well as cultural practices like preventing the exposure of skin with long garments and the swaddling of babies. On the other hand, in Iceland, very few archaeological individuals have been diagnosed with vitamin D deficiency, despite the extended season of darkness during the winter months, likely because of the availability of vitamin D containing food, such as fish, and occupational factors such as outdoor farm work. Today, vitamin D deficiency generally affects people of advanced age, and certain ethnicities are, uh, and occurs secondary to uh, me other medical conditions. Other diseases, such as tuberculosis, have gone through phases of increased and decreased prevalence in society across time in response to environmental condition and changes. 
It is not only people that shape the environment, but the environment in our interaction with it shapes us too. For example, recent research has shown that volcanic eruptions can trigger severe worldwide environmental changes, such as volcanic seasons, which are characterized by darkness, famine, and pestilence. The low irradiance of the sun following six century eruptions that likely occurred in Iceland caused cooling weather in the Mediterranean, thereby providing environmental conditions suitable for the disease vectors responsible for the Justinian plague pandemic to spread across the region and result in the death of up to one fourth of the world's population at the time. While it is clear that pathogens adapt to the many ways in which humans fend them off, we must likewise recognize that we too adapt to pathogenic organisms, the environment and the forces that, they ex that it exerts, from which we cannot be separated. In conclusion, looking at these cases indicates social care, which gives indications about social values and cultural emotion in the past. We must be careful about interpreting the past through modern perspectives and remain especially weary about trying to uh, estimate the emotions of individual people. However, examining the level of care that archaeological individuals received can give us some theoretical measure of the collective societal emotions held by past communities, which in medieval Iceland were often small and familial. In the case of cleft palate provided here, for example, several caretakers were almost certainly involved in early childhood, and others likely provided assistance with seeking further medical care and, uh, at the monastery later on. As might be expected, this suggests that families and other community members took care of their own in whatever ways they could. Looking to past examples of rare diseases, human variation, and developmental anomalies demonstrates the continuity not only of those conditions, but also of how we as a society perceive and manage the social impacts of them. We often hear questions like, why are so many people depressed today? When I was growing up, no one was depressed, and if they said they were, they were just told to grow up and get on with it. Some sociologists and clinicians suggest that cultural and technological developments such as smartphones and social media influence have altered people's sense of well-being and confidence and have thereby increased rates of anxiety and depression. While it's impossible to measure whether or not depression or anxiety have actually increased or not, they may have appeared to increase because, of, because it is less taboo or more common to talk about them, understand them, and treat them for what they are. However, at least four out of 10 people with a rare disease experiences anxiety and or depression as a result of isolation and even discrimination that they face from the general public and more importantly, medical practitioners that do not necessarily understand, believe in, or have the ability to assist with their conditions. Physical and mental health really cannot be treated as separate issues. Rare diseases, something we must also re reframe our perspective about, have affected and continue to affect millions of people worldwide. In the past, due to the lack of modern technology, medicine, and transport, interpersonal social care was absolutely vital for survival. Today, we have the opportunity to evolve our concept of social care and create infrastructures that are not only designed for the able-bodied, healthy, young, and unimpaired, which can directly diminish the disabling and marginalizing aspects of our cities and societies. Thank you for listening to me today. <laughs>